Hi there, and welcome to our third lecture podcast in Canada in the Making, Understanding Canadian History. You have reached Unit 3, Natives and Newcomers, the Transatlantic Age 1000 to 1661 CE. In this podcast, we're going to be talking about first contact between the Old World and the New World. We'll try to understand what gave rise to the European Age of Exploration, which was the point where Europe began to explore and they came into contact with the Americas, meeting the indigenous people who already lived there. Of course, the results of uh, first contact over time were horrendous uh, for the indigenous people. Untold millions of them died as a result, uh, but it's part of history and so we have to cover it. And so we're going to um, uh, try to understand those initial interactions interactions between Europeans and Indigenous people. And uh, so here we go. Let's uh, get started. So the learning objectives for this unit are, number one, articulate the concept of the Columbian exchange. Number two, understand the European cultural heritage, which gave rise to the age of exploration. Number three, Describe the early relations between First Nations and European colonists. Number four, describe the beginnings of New France. So, as we talked about last week, the history of the Indigenous peoples of the Americas is one of isolation from the rest of um, human culture in the Old World. And as I had indicated last week, the Old World had always had some form of communication within it. So um, Europe, Asia, Africa, India, they all had some form of contact between one another. And this meant that technology was shared from one region of the Old World to another, and also diseases were shared from one region uh, of the Old World to another. So all people who lived in the Old World, from Africa to Europe to Asia, had some immunities to certain diseases. Um, unfortunately for the indigenous peoples of the Americas, once first contact happened, those diseases were spread into the Americas and the indigenous peoples there had no natural immunity to them and their populations were absolutely decimated as a result. In many ways, um, the uh, um, uh, actual first contact, the real dangers of first contact was the spreading of diseases. That was what killed the most amount of people. Um, afterwards, colonization would kill more people and subjugate and oppress those who remained. But it was the diseases that initially wiped out millions of indigenous peoples of both North and South America. So we traditionally date first contact to uh, Christopher Columbus, who sailed in 1492 and, and I'll put this in big quotation marks, discovered America. We'll come back to that. He, he wasn't the first European to actually reach the Americas, but he is the most important because after that point, um, there was constant contact between Europe and the Americas. And this is why we talk about the contact that followed uh, Columbus's voyage in 1492 as the Columbian Exchange. And the Columbian Exchange was this massive interchange of biological and some cultural elements between the old and the new world. So that meant that uh, crops and animals that had only been a part of one part of the world were suddenly now introduced to a new part of the world. So last week I talked about how um, indigenous farming had developed um, uh, and domesticated plants such as tomatoes and corn or maize and potatoes, uh, but pumpkins and squash and peppers, those were all other crops that Europeans had never tasted. Cacao, um, which is what chocolate is made from, pineapple, apple, tobacco, beans, vanilla, none of these things were known to Europeans. On the other side, uh, we have things like bananas and sugar and coffee beans and olives and onions and citrus fruits. None of those things were known in the New World. So like coffee, for example, now is grown, um, you know, some of the best coffee in the world is grown in South America and Brazil, but coffee is not a native plant to the Americas. It actually originated in Africa first 
So there was a massive exchange in terms of different crops. And also, unfortunately, there was the diseases that were brought from the old world, such as smallpox, influenza, typhus, measles, etc. Um, Europeans had also domesticated animals. And although um, uh, agriculture had been uh, practiced in the New World, um, the domestication of livestock was not. And so uh, cattle, sheep, pigs and horses were introduced into the Americas as well. Ironically, the horse, which was reintroduced during the Columbian Exchange to the Americas, um, actually evolved in the Americas, but we think was hunted out of existence uh, towards the end of the last Ice Age. And so there hadn't been a horse in the Americas for thousands of years uh, when in the 16th century, the horse was suddenly reintroduced again. So this is what we call the Columbian Exchange, this massive interchange of biological and cultural elements between the old and the the new world. So beginning in the middle of the 15th century or the 1450s, Europe enters into a period in which they begin to um, send ships out and explore the rest of the world. Um, and this is sometimes referred to um, by historians as the age of exploration. And it's really sort of a curious thing. Um, why was it Europe out of all the other old world um, areas? Why was it Europeans ended up being the ones to start this period of exploration and ultimately reconnect the old world with the new world and uh, all the consequences that would obviously ensue once that contact happened? Well, there's no real simple answer to that. It's really a series of historical accidents uh, historical events in the end of the Middle Ages, which propelled Europe on a course of action, which would ultimately end up having them enter into this age of exploration and have them um, uh, running into the Americas. It's not to say that there weren't other places in the old world where there was um, sailing technology that was advanced enough that they um, might have uh, made those voyages. For example, China had pretty sophisticated sailing technology and had they chosen to sail their ships across the Pacific, it's quite possible that they might have run into the Americas, but we have no evidence prior to European contact with the New World of any other Old World group uh, reaching uh, the, the New World. So as far as we know, um, it was the European first contact um, uh, that was the first one. And in, in any respect, regardless, that's the one that matters because from that point onward, uh, from uh, Columbus's voyage of 1492, really it's at that point that the Old World and the New World are reconnected and um, the Columbian exchange has begun. So let's start off with the fact that Europe really did not have any uh, great knowledge of the world, certainly not in the Middle Ages. Um, the Old World always had some communication going back and forth. I already indicated that to you. Um, this is a map of the known world that was produced in Europe during the Middle Ages. So obviously it looks nothing like anything that we would think of as the world. It, it um, and it is in fact a mixture of myth and a bit of a, a bit of fact mixed in there. Um, if you're trying looking at it, thinking what is this map? Um, part of it, the problem is, is that north is actually um, over here. So uh, north is actually. Uh, drawn sideways on the map. So you would have to flip it around um, to see the map the way uh, we normally have north pointing up. But I suppose there's no real reason why north has to be pointing up on a map. It's just convention. Um, and so this um, area here in the middle is what for Europeans was considered the center of the world because Europe was Christian. And this is the Holy Land and Jerusalem. So Jerusalem and the Holy Land where Jesus had lived, uh, that was considered the center of the world. And so this black area here in the middle of the um, of the map is actually the Mediterranean. And so that would make this area over here would be Europe. And this area over here is Africa and then Asia and the Middle East and China and India are everything sort of towards the top of the map right there. Um, so obviously you wouldn't want to um, navigate with this. This isn't Google Maps or anything like that. And it does show that the knowledge that um, Europeans had of the world was extremely limited. They were aware of their old world neighbors, but certainly they were completely ignorant of the existence of the Americas. Much of what Europe knew about the world came down to them from this fellow. His name was Ptolemy, and he lived during the period of ancient Rome, so during the Roman Empire, and he lived around uh, the first century 
um, CE. And Ptolemy wrote one of the most important defining uh, geography books, which was widely read during the Middle Ages. Um, certainly it was read by people like Christopher Columbus. And in it, Ptolemy um, basically talked about everything that he had learned and, and researched about uh, the geography of the world as a whole. And in it, although he had never visited these places, he talked about India and he talked about China. And, you know, with not completely inaccurate information about those areas. And he talked about Africa. So he was aware of the basic uh, outlines of the old world. Even if it wasn't perfect, it was there. However, Ptolemy knew nothing about the Americas. Uh, so um, the discovery of those uh, lands would be um, really um, earth shattering in terms of the worldview of people in Europe and in the rest of the old world. There are also examples in the old world of uh, explorers, people who had begun to travel around the old world between its various component parts. So we know that the old world had always had some form of communication from one area to another area. But there's not too many examples, though, of people traveling from one region to another region. Uh, but one is Marco Polo, who lived during the Middle Ages. Now, according to Marco Polo's book, he wrote a book about his, his experiences. Uh, he traveled from Europe uh, all the way to India and in China and then back. And in his book, um, he described various magical creatures such as dragons that he encountered, but he also got a lot of information actually reasonably accurate uh, and that matches up with known history from India and China about rulers that were in control of various areas, that sort of thing. So we know that even if Marco Polo didn't travel there, he must have spoken to somebody who had because he got a lot of things right. Now, his book was actually the medieval equivalent of a bestseller. Many people read it. And in fact, Christopher Columbus had a copy of that book with him on his fateful voyages in, the, in 1492, where he would um, come in uh, to the Americas. So uh, uh, there were some examples of old world exploration prior to the age of exploration. Another example, and this is from the Chinese side, are the voyages of Zheng Hao, which happened again uh, during the Middle Ages in the late 14th, early 15th century. So Zheng Hao was a Chinese explorer and he took a fleet of ships from China and they sailed around Southeast Asia and then they went around India over to the Middle East and then down the coast of Africa, setting up trading posts, exploring the Red Sea. It was quite a significant um, bit of exploration. Um, however, it was brief-lived, this period of Chinese exploration. Um, technically, his ships were likely advanced enough that had um, Zheng Hao decided to take his ships across the Pacific Ocean, he likely would have run into California, uh, but he didn't, as far as we know, and as far as we know, nobody did from China. And after this period, uh, China entered into a, a period of, of isolation, and there weren't any repeats of Zheng Hao's voyage. In fact, according to legend, his ships were actually burned upon returning to China so that knowledge about these lands that he had visited um, would not be widely known. Um, but certainly there were examples then from the other side of old world exploration. And all this leads us to this fellow, Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus normally gets all the credit um, when he quote unquote discovered America. Now, of course, that's pretty silly because we know that there were plenty of people already living in these lands that he discovered, anywhere from 50 to 100 million people. So really, Christopher Columbus didn't discover anything that wasn't already known to human beings. Uh, it was discovering it for himself, I suppose, or for other Europeans. Um, and Christopher Columbus um, wasn't even the first European to reach the Americas, as I'll explain in, in a few minutes. Um, but he is still important, and his voyage in 1492 really does usher in a new age, because from that point onward, the old world and the new world become interconnected. Um, it's where we date real first contact from, because Christopher Columbus would uh, usher in a new age of constant uh, Europeans coming over to the Americas and beginning to exploit it for its riches uh, and that sort of stuff. There was no putting the genie back into the bottle. Columbus himself uh, was um, uh, hired by Spain, even though he wasn't Spanish, he was Italian, and he was hired to find a new route to uh, India and China. And that was his reason for taking his big gamble and sailing across the ocean and then running into this unknown continent in the process. And that brings us to um, a number of myths about first contact that I'd like to dispel before we move forward. Okay. 
So let's talk about some of these myths. Myth number one, Columbus discovered America. This is, you know, frequently, you know, American uh, school children learn it this way. And of course, it's nonsense. Um, in fact, he wasn't even the first European. The first Europeans to visit the Americas were actually the Vikings um, who reached there in about the ninth or 10th century. And, and I'll talk about the Vikings in just a minute. Um, and they are a really interesting people, uh, but they didn't stay long and their knowledge about the Americas was not widespread. And so we don't date first contact from when they reached the Americas. Um, but rather from when Columbus did. But, but Columbus certainly didn't discover anything. So myth number two, everyone thought the world was flat. Now, I hear this myth all the time, and it's just not true. Really, at no point in history did anyone think the world was flat who was educated. And it doesn't matter whether you were from China or from India or from the uh, Mesoamerican civilizations or whether you were from Europe. Pretty much all educated people had figured out and had known for thousands of years that the world was round. Really simple mathematics can demonstrate that. And even anecdotal evidence of just watching a ship disappear on the horizon where the last thing that you will see would be the mast dipping below the horizon. People knew the world was round. Now that doesn't mean they knew about the Americas. They certainly didn't. People in the old world had no idea North and South America existed. They also didn't know whether the ocean was crossable. They thought it was way too large, that no ship could possibly survive such a long voyage to cross the ocean. So there were lots of reasons why no one had actually tried doing this before Columbus. But it wasn't because they thought the world was flat. And it wasn't because they thought they were going to sail off the end of the world. It's not to say that some people somewhere might have thought the world was flat, but no educated people thought the world was flat. Okay, the next myth, uh, that the Americas were largely empty of people. This is a myth that has been per perpetuated often um, by um, colonial scholars in, in the Americas, in a way trying to look at the past with rose-colored glasses. The idea that the, you know, the North and South America were pristine wildernesses and, you know, there was a few native people living here or there, but mostly it was empty. And this is just not true. Um, of course, as we've already demonstrated in this course, there were many, many people living in North and South America, anywhere from 50 to 100 million people. Um, there was an incredible variety of complex and varied civilizations and cultures and lifestyles. So uh, it just is a bit of a myth. And this is partially um, because um, so many of the indigenous people would be killed off very shortly after first contact. Um, that within a few hundred years, their population would be a fraction of what it was before. And this is what ended up leading to the perpetuation of this myth that the Americas were largely empty when the Euro Europeans arrived. And the final myth is this idea that Europeans conquered America because they had superior weapons. Now, it is true that the Americans did, uh, the, the North and South America didn't really have weapons as powerful as the guns and cannons that were now available to Europeans, but that doesn't mean that that was the reason why Europeans found it relatively easy to conquer. First of all, in the beginning, they didn't find it easy to conquer. It doesn't matter if you have a gun when you are facing millions of people who have um, bows and arrows. Um, you're only able to use that gun so much, and, and the guns frankly, at, at that time, were not very good. It took a long time to load a single shot, and the shots weren't very accurate. It definitely was not because of guns that Europeans were able to conquer the Americas. It was because of their diseases. European diseases were the greatest factor for why uh, they were able to conquer the Americas. Their diseases did it for them. As soon as they arrived, they unknowingly passed along smallpox, measles, all these old world diseases for which all old world populations had some degree of immunity and to which the North American and South American peoples had no immunity whatsoever. And this killed millions of them. So I had already said that Christopher Columbus wasn't even the first European to reach the Americas, and this is true. There are um, hints at various points in time in European sources that suggest that maybe some people had um, discovered or knew about the Americas prior to Christopher Columbus. Uh, there's hints in literature and, and legends, but there's little definitive proof. Um, one example might be an Irish monk named St. Brendan. There are stories about Brendan sailing with a group of monks off into the Atlantic Ocean 
and encountering some very cold lands far across the ocean and there trying to set up um, a church and then uh, returning in failure. And But these stories are also filled with all kinds of magical elements. There's stories about um, uh, Brendan doing a church service on the back of a whale. And so certainly this is not really any real evidence per se, but there's hints in this in these stories that maybe there was some knowledge of these lands. Um, there's also um, legends that Portuguese fishermen had figured out uh, that off the Grand Banks of, of Newfoundland that there were really rich uh, fisheries and fish stocks there and that they didn't pass along that knowledge uh, to others because they didn't want others to know about these great you know fishing areas and say go fish there and come back but again these are legends there's no definitive proof that they actually had been there um, the first definitive proof we have is of the Vikings and they're the ones I'm going to talk about next so the Vikings, who were also known as the Norse, were Northern Europeans. Uh, they are famous during the Middle Ages mostly for being warriors because they did a lot of invasions. They invaded um, pretty much every part of Europe at one point in time or another. And there's a, a very popular television series called The Vikings on uh, Netflix that you can watch if you want to see a, a modern sort of take on, on their stories. Um, but certainly the Vikings were really good explorers. They were expert seamen. And they, um, we have documented evidence of them exploring all around Europe and eventually exploring Greenland, Iceland, and finally in the 10th century, reaching a coast of, an, of a land that they referred to as Vinland, but we know uh, was Canada and likely Newfoundland. And there they um, uh, attempted to set up a settlement, but um, they came into conflict um, with the local inhabitants. and. That settlement we now know is in a place that is known uh, today as Lons O Meadows in Newfoundland. Um, and because of, at least according to the Viking stories, because they could not get along with the local indigenous inhabitants, after one winter there, a very cold winter for which the Vikings weren't really prepared for, they decided the heck with this and they sailed home. And over time, these stories just became myths and legends. And for a long time, that was what people thought. They thought that um, these Viking stories were just that, myths and legends, that, that the Vikings hadn't actually been to North America. So here's the routes that they that they took in their exploration. So you can see they explored around Europe and and in Scandinavia. Where the purple area there in Scandinavia is where the Vikings were from, which is basically you know modern day uh, Denmark, Norway, um, Sweden, and uh, the Vikings then traveled to Iceland and to Greenland. You can see they're basically island hopping their way over to North America. And in the 9th and 10th century, they actually reached um, uh, North America. So as I said, for a long time, people thought that these were just myths and legends, that it didn't actually happen. Um, but an archaeological discovery in the 20th century um, actually finally put that to rest. And we now know that the Vikings really did reach Canada. Um, there, this is um, uh, the remains of a Viking settlement uh, in Lonzo Meadows in Newfoundland. And it's actually a, uh, a national historical site. Um, it's really um, an exciting place to visit visit if you um, are ever in that part of Canada. Um, it's it's a, you know, a really interesting um, historical place. To, they've got lots of really interesting plaques and stuff to read about it. Um, but this is um, a direct evidence we know for sure that the Vikings had actually reached the Americas. Which brings us back to Christopher Columbus in 1492. So this is the one that's different, though, because when Christopher Columbus sailed, of course, it wasn't myths and legends. He told everybody about his voyage and everyone then went out and confirmed it for themselves. Within just a few years, all kinds of European countries were sailing to the Americas. So why did Christopher Columbus go on this voyage? What were these historical circumstances that I talked about a little while earlier that prompted Europeans to begin this age of exploration? In order to explain why the age of exploration happened, we have to know something about European history. So this is um, a really simplistic way of looking at European history on a timeline. 
So um, this is a timeline is really just a way of roughly dividing the past into different periods. And so there's the Roman Empire, which ends around the year 500, and then the Middle Ages, which go roughly from the year 500, roughly to the year 1500. And then we enter into the early modern period. This is really when the age of exploration takes off. And finally, beginning in 1789, which is the date that the French Revolution begins, we enter into the modern era, which I guess we're still living in the modern era. Um, so that's just a rough idea. But I mean, really, um, there's all kinds of other ways of dividing it up. So often the Renaissance, which is a period of artistic and intellectual development in Europe, begins around the year 1300, and extends to 1600. That's another division. Or the Reformation, which was a period in which Christianity was um, broken up into many, many different versions of Christianity across Europe. Um, that's another important way of dividing up the past in that period. And finally, of course, there's the Age of exploration. Sometimes people talk about that from 1450 to 1700. Look, all of these are fairly subjective, these divisions. So don't get too hung up on, you know, a 1500 versus, you know, 1476 or whatever. The, these are just rough dates. And certainly people at the time didn't know that they were living in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance or whatnot. These are divisions that historians apply. But nevertheless, the reason why we use these divisions is because is because they do signify important developments that are taking place in the history and they can partially explain why we reach the age of exploration. So at the end of the Middle Ages, so at the end of this period in red, a lot of things were changing in Europe. And that's what the Renaissance from 1300 really speaks to. Um, Europe was becoming much, much more modern. We were entering into a, um, a very modern economy with capitalism and the European countries were really in direct competition to one another. And it is in fact that direct competition, which partially leads to the age of exploration. So towards the end of the Middle Ages, um, because uh, the economy was picking up um, in particular in Europe, there were some advances in shipping technology, um, in, in sailing technology, such as the, the compass, which wasn't invented in this period, but it was um, refined during this period. The compass is, of course, a device which tells you where north is. And the astrolabe, which was a device in which you could take a measurement um, from a star and be able to determine uh, what your latitude is. And these were key um, pieces of equipment in order to do a massive ocean going uh, voyage. We also see towards the end of the Middle Ages some advances in cartography, which is map making. And this also made long distance sailing easier because they had more accurate maps. So the Mappy Mundi that I'd shown you at the beginning of this, um, they were making better maps towards the end of the Middle Ages, let me put it that way. Um, we also see the development of the Caravel which, and other fully rigged ships. These are these massive wooden sailing vessels with really, really big sails and also that are very stable and that can handle pretty rough weather on the open ocean. These were ships that were built for long uh, voyages, um, voyages uh, ideally going to India or China, but also they could be going to the Americas once they started going in that direction as well too. And here you see an image uh, from the 16th century of uh, some of those caravel ships in the harbor of Lisbon in Portugal. So as I indicated, at the end of the Middle Ages in the 1400s, there were a number of changes taking place in Europe, which led to um, the age of discovery. So first off, as I've already said, there was um, an increase in trade and capitalism. So Europe was really waking up uh, economically during that time. And all of the individual countries in Europe were in competition with one another uh, from an economic standpoint and from a military standpoint as well. We also see in this period a number of other um, changes. One set of changes is that kings um, who are at the head of governments become more powerful. So during the Middle Ages, kings actually weren't that powerful. Um, nobles and other barons of the land were much more powerful than kings. But once we get to the end of the Middle Ages and early modern period, we start to see really powerful kings, kings that we call absolutist kings. Um, and the form of government they practice is called absolutism. Under absolutism, one person really has complete control. They have absolute power. And this is sort of similar to a dictatorship, but it's different in the sense that a kingship is hereditary um, and kingship is also bound up in all the ideas about being a king so that they are appointed by God and they have the divine right to be a king. And so all these associations um, kept 
um, uh, being attached to kings, but kings were also becoming extremely powerful. And so this is called absolutism, and it emerges at the end of the Middle Ages. And it's important once we get into the Age of Discovery, because these kings are essentially competing with one another um, for colonies and discoveries, um, notching up their, um, their achievements, so to speak. Um, and also, from 1517 onward, we have Christianity breaking up into many, many, many different versions of Christianity. We call this the Protestant Reformation. And this is extremely important for the subsequent history of Canada, because what it means is that different European countries adopted slightly different versions of Christianity. And then once they set up their colonies in the Americas, these colonies will be competing with one another to convert the indigenous people to their version of Christianity. So during the Middle Ages, there was really only one type of Christianity. But then after the Protestant Reformation, we had many different types. We had uh, Catholicism or Catholics. We had, um, you know, all the Protestant faiths, such as Anglicanism or uh, Presbyterianism or Baptism or whatever, there, or Puritanism. Those were all Christian faiths and they were all competing against one another. And so splitting Christianity into many different versions really accentuated this sense of competition and rivalry between different countries in Europe, because now they weren't even the same faith anymore. But the biggest event which really propelled Europe into the age of exploration is um, a simple event of war. And that was the fall of the city of Constantinople in 1453. So Constantinople was arguably the most important city in the world and incredibly important to Europeans and for European trade. It was conquered in 1453 by an Islamic empire known as the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire. So this is a map of early modern Europe, and here's where Constantinople was. Constantinople was an ancient city. It had been founded during the Roman Empire, and for centuries it had really been the most important city in the Western world. It was thought of as a gateway city uh, between East and West. It was perfectly situated to be that gateway city. Nearly all trade coming from India and China flowed into Europe through the city of Constantinople and vice versa. So uh, its strategic importance really can't be understated. Throughout the Middle Ages, it was the Christian capital of the Byzantine Empire, which was a Christian, Christian empire. But towards the end of the Middle Ages, a new Islamic force, the Ottoman Empire, began to expand and breaking apart the Byzantine Empire. And eventually, in 1453, the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople itself. And Constantinople was renamed Istanbul. And from this point onward, the trade between East and West in Europe is effectively shut off. Europe, which had been becoming wealthy because of this trade with China and India, suddenly found itself um, without any route uh, to get access to those markets because of course the Ottoman Empire was a competitor to the European states and so they had no interest in in allowing them to access those markets when the Ottoman Empire would prefer to control it. So this more than any other reason would propel Europeans to try to find new ways to access those markets in India and China. So I'm going to show you a short clip from a video now from a documentary series that um, uh, I have as recommended videos nearly every week of this course. It's um, a, a series that was produced by CBC called Canada, A People's History. And this is a short clip which talks about the fall of Constantinople and the importance it was held for um, the subsequent age of discovery. The native people of North America didn't venture out to explore any other continent. But from across the ocean, others would come to them. Sometime during the first millennium in Europe, a radical new idea emerged. There was something out there, some new land beyond the Atlantic horizon. 
One of the earliest mentions is a far-fetched story of an Irish monk named Brendan. The story says that in the year 565, Brendan and 17 disciples went searching for a land of solitude. They sailed for seven years, a journey fraught with danger through undiscovered waters. Monsters rose off their bow. Mermaids swam in their wake. Brendan even claimed to have held mass on the back of a whale. And then the monks came to land. Their small boat bobbed perilously close to the forbidding rocks of the coastline. Soldiers of Christ, be strong in faith unfeigned, and in the armor of the Spirit, for we are now in the confines of hell. Watch therefore, and act manfully. A few centuries passed in Europe before the next stories emerged of a new world, this time told by the Vikings. The Vikings were marauders, feared and loathed in Europe before they sailed west, first to Iceland, then Greenland. They were expert seamen, and they continued west until land loomed on their horizon. They found a small sheltered bay at the end of a great peninsula. They built a wayfaring station and a repair depot for their ships and settled in for the winter. But the Vikings discovered there were people here, people they called Skraelings, after trolls in Scandinavian myth. The Vikings encountered a small group of these people and killed them. From that day, the settlement became a target. They were ill-favored men with ugly hair on their heads. They had big eyes and were broad in the cheeks. They hissed like geese. Though the quality of the land was admirable, there would always be fear and strife docking them on account of those who already inhabited it. So they made ready to leave. At the time, no one took the Viking stories seriously. And for 400 years, the great expeditions were heading somewhere else, to the east. Vast caravans to fabled Cathay and India, bringing back gold, silk, cinnamon, pearls, and pepper. This was Europe. 50 million people, with its great capitals and city-states, Paris, London, Venice, Genoa. Much of Europe's wealth came from its trade with Asia. And Constantinople was the gateway that connected them. Then, in 1453, a disaster for Europe. Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks. Now Europe needed a new trade route to Asia and looked west across the Atlantic. No one suspected there might be an entire continent in the way. There was not only an entire continent across the Atlantic. There was a different universe, full of its own peoples and societies. Over 500 generations, North America had become a continent of nations unlike anything the world had ever seen. The northern part was occupied and claimed by hundreds of tribes dozens of distinct peoples, each with its own way of life, its own gods, its own kind of wealth, its own name and lands. 
The Northwest was the land of the Dene, the Athapascan, the Slavey and the Dog Rib, the Tuchoni, the Klinget, and the Guichen. In the Arctic, the distant, isolated world of the Inuit. Along the Pacific coast, the Haida, the Salish, the Kwakutl and the Yukwat, the Nishka, and the Gitsan. The people of the plains, the Blackfoot, the Blood, the Sarsi, and the Pagan. In the northern woodlands, the Cree and the Chippewyan. Near the Great Lakes, the Anishinaabe, the Algonquin, the farmers and warriors of the Iroquois and the Wendat. In the east, the nations of the Beothic, the Maliseet, the Innu, the Abnaki, and the Mi'kmaq. They knew the land as their own. Corners of the country they called Dununde, Nunavut, Kanata, Canada. So even before the fall of Constantinople, Europeans were experimenting with different routes to try to reach Asia and China. For example, during the 1400s, Portuguese um, uh, merchants had actually uh, been able to um, sail successfully around the Horn of Africa and set up trading posts along the way, along the African coastline, and reach markets in India and China. And this uh, gave the Portuguese a remarkable head start in that way. Uh, it also sadly um, involved the Portuguese in the slave trade, first of all. They were the first European country to get involved in that, um, partially because they had set up these trading posts along the way. Um, however, because the Portuguese got there first, they pretty much had a lock on that. And other European countries, like Spain, wanted access to those markets as well, too. And with the fall of Constantinople, they needed to find a new way to do it. Which leads us back to Christopher Columbus's voyage in 1492. So Christopher Columbus uh, convinced the Spanish king and queen that he had a better idea, a new idea on how they could reach the markets of India and China. And of course, Spain was nervous that Portugal had um, it was getting a head start on being able to access those markets. And now with the fall of Constantinople, European countries are really desperate to find new routes to those markets. And so they um, said yes to Columbus's idea. And Columbus set sail in 1492 with a few ships. Uh, hoping to reach India and China. And what did he reach instead? He ran smack dab into the Caribbean. Now, Columbus ended up making four different trips over his lifetime to the Americas, and he never figured out in all those trips that he had not, in fact, reached India and China, and that he, in fact, had run into a brand new set of continents that were completely unknown in Europe. Um, and in fact, Columbus kept writing in his journal um, that the people that he was encountering were Indians, which is why we are still, um, some people still call the indigenous peoples of the Americas Indians, even though they're not Indian, they're not from India, <laughs> they have nothing to do with India, and yet they're still called Indians because Christopher Columbus was basically an idiot. Anyway, Christopher Columbus also kept thinking that he was on the verge of discovering Japan when he was really just, you know, exploring, um, you know, parts of what is now the Dominican Republic. In any respect, Columbus never figured it out. He, after, even after his fourth voyage, he still was convinced that he was exploring parts of Asia on those voyages. It would actually be another Italian explorer, Amerigo Vespucci, uh, who would actually figure it out that these were not uh, this was not India and China, that this was in fact uh, two new continents. Um, and that's why it was Amerigo's name that was applied on the first maps of the region by Europeans. And it's why we call it North and South America after Amerigo, rather than North and South Colombia after uh, Columbus. Now the area that Spain had uh, run into happened to be uh, the most developed part of the New World in terms of civilization 
uh, that Europeans would understand. Um, because this is the area of Mesoamerica, which was part of the Aztec Empire, and before the Aztecs had been the Maya, and this was a city-based civilization, very similar in many ways to European cities. Um, big buildings, advanced architecture, and also the Aztecs prized some of the same shiny rocks that Europeans and Old World people prized, and that's silver and gold. So it meant that the Aztecs were rich in something that the Spanish desperately wanted. Um, this was a major advantage ultimately for Spain. Spain would get a big head start on the other European countries of exploiting the riches of the New World. And it's partially because of the good fortune of where they ran into. They ran into the Aztec Empire. So the Aztecs, and this is a map here you see of Central America, Mesoamerica. This is what is basically the southern part of Mexico. The Yucatan Peninsula there is... Um, uh, you know, right nearby where Cancun, Mexico is, and this is a major tourist destination today. So this was the heart of the Aztec Empire. And the Aztecs were a relatively new empire. They had conquered um, their neighbors only a few hundred years before. And so they weren't actually very well liked in the region. Um, nevertheless, the Aztecs had their capital city, um, uh, which was built on uh, built in the location that modern day Mexico City is built on top of. And their capital city was named Tenochtitlan. And let me just show you what it might have looked like. This is an artist's impression of what the great Aztec city of Tenochtitlan might have looked like. It must have been absolutely uh, incredible to see. It was an architectural marvel. It was a city built in the middle of a lake, um, which would have been incredibly difficult to do. And the streets were in fact canals, just like Venice, Italy. Um, so it must have been really beautiful to see. And I'm going to show you another image, a contemporary image, which is a bird's eye view. Okay, here you go. Here's another image of what Chinochitlan must have looked like. So the Spanish um, initially uh, set up, uh, uh, you know, initial colonies on the Caribbean islands, and they did. They left the Aztecs alone, at least initially. Uh, but it would be a Spanish conquistador named um, Cortez, Hernan Cortez, who would sail to the mainland with a group of only 200 soldiers. And with those 200 soldiers, he would manage to conquer the entirety of the Aztec Empire, which contained millions of people. Now, to understand how this happened, we have to understand a little bit of the dynamics that uh, the Aztecs were facing at that time. So the Aztecs, as I said, were a relatively new empire. They had conquered um, most of Mesoamerica in the last 200 years. And so many of the indigenous peoples within the empire were conquered peoples. And they viewed the Aztecs, who were really from North Mexico, as an invading force. And once the Spanish arrived, the 200 soldiers, very quickly, the 200 soldiers found many, many allies in these oppressed indigenous tribes that wanted to see the Aztecs uh, get what was coming to them. And so they joined the ranks of the Spanish. So the 200 soldiers, their army swelled very quickly to tens of thousands. And also uh, the Spanish had one other advantage, and that is that they were bringing their diseases with them. And indeed, in fact, uh, smallpox and other diseases uh, swept through the Aztec populations and really weakened them in advance of Cortez's uh, arrival. And so here you see um, an artist imagining Hernan Cortez, the Spanish conquistador, meeting the king of the Aztecs, Montezuma. And of course, this was a fateful meeting. Uh, Montezuma would ultimately lose his entire empire. Uh, there was plenty of cultural misunderstandings. When Cortes was advancing with his army, Montezuma wanted to exert his dominance. And under Aztec society, um, it was considered um, uh, demeaning to accept gifts from someone. If you accepted gifts from someone, that was a way of you saying that I am subservient to you. And so Montezuma wanted to exert his dominance, so he sent all kinds of gifts ahead to uh, Cortez with his army. 
And Cortez, of course, being European, didn't interpret it that way at all. He interpreted this as a bribe, that Montezuma was scared of him. In any respect, after just a couple of years, the Aztec Empire was entirely conquered, and the Spanish felt free to start to set up their new colony of New Spain. And New Spain would essentially suck the land dry of all of the gold and silver and send it back into Europe. And for a period of time, Spain would become the most powerful country in Europe as a result. A few years after conquering the Aztec Empire, the Spanish did the same thing to the Inca Empire, another city-based civilization in South America. So the Spanish essentially had a monopoly on Central America, South America, and a little bit of the southern part of North America before any of the other European countries had really gotten in on the action. It didn't take long, however, before other European countries began to send out their own explorers, hoping to strike it rich, like the Spanish had. So England, France, and the Netherlands all began to send out expeditions. Um, for the point of view of Canadian history, um, one expedition that was that of the Italian sailor John Cabot. You notice all these sailors are Italians. That's because the Italians were the best sailors of Europe at that time. So they kept being hired out by all the other European countries. So John Cabot, or Giovanni Cabato, as he most likely would have called himself, um, was sailing when he, again, we're going to put that in quotation marks, discovers North America in 1497. Um, what he really did was rediscover, from the European point of view, Newfoundland. And this is important because it provided a different reason for Europeans to exploit the New World. So whereas Spain had had the good fortune of running into the Aztec Empire where there was gold and silver, uh, the French and the English were exploring North America where gold and silver wasn't as easy to come by. So what was there? There was fish, lots of it, and there were furs. Once they began to trade with the indigenous peoples, they were able to trade for furs, and furs were incredibly valuable for Europe from a European point of view. Uh, Europe had really hunted out of ex existence all little furry animals um, for a long time prior to the age of exploration. There weren't any beavers anymore anywhere in Europe, pretty much. And so when Europeans had the chance to get furs at a fairly cheap rate from trading with indigenous people, they jumped at the opportunity. So I have a, another short video to show you. This is a Heritage Minute. Heritage Minutes were um, short one minute little mini films that sort of ran as commercials on television since the 1990s in Canada. And they were meant to depict different moments in Canadian history. And in fact, the project upcoming in this course uh, will ask you to review one of these Heritage Minutes. So I have a Heritage Minute which depicts uh, John Cabot or Giovanni Cabato and quote unquote discovering Newfoundland and the great fish stocks off of Newfoundland in 1497. So here you go. And that's, you won't believe your eyes. Captain, over here! You must see this! Look at the captain down there! I've never seen anything like it in my life! They stayed the progress of our ship. Your fleets will have no further need of Iceland. Fish is enough to feed this kingdom. Oh, sire. Until the end of time. So after John Cabot's um, uh, rediscovery of Newfoundland in the late 1400s, uh, France waited a few decades before it uh, began again exploring, and this time under an explorer named Jacques Cartier, who was sent by the King of France in 1534 to explore the so-called Northern Lands. Uh, these were the lands that at this point in time, Europe knew that were there, uh, but they didn't really have a good idea of exactly um, uh, what they consisted of. And 
so Jacques Cartier was sent to claim any um, open land for France and to potentially find a new route uh, to Asia to bring spices and other things uh, back home. He uh, actually made three voyages, one in 1534, again a couple of years later, and his final voyage in 1541 to 1543. And these were really the first real substantial French explorations of the area which would one day be called Canada. So this is a map which shows you uh, the, uh, the basic route that Jacques Cartier took in 1534 during his first voyage. And you can see that he sails around Newfoundland, essentially in some of the same areas that the Vikings had been centuries earlier. Uh, but then he also sailed up the St. Lawrence River, and there he encountered various indigenous tribes. And this was really going to subsequently be the focus for French um, uh, exploration and an attempted French colony in the years to come. When Jacques Cartier sailed up the St. Lawrence River, he actually found two major indigenous uh, villages. One was called Stadacona, which is essentially where modern day Quebec City is, and one was Hochelaga, which is essentially where modern day Montreal was. Um, and the region appears on a map that he drew for the very first time being referred to as Canada. And this is very interesting. It's a still a little bit of a mystery about how um, this word came to be applied to the land. The best guess is that in the Iroquois language, uh, Kanata uh, means village, and somehow Jacques Cartier might have confused the word for village when he was speaking with indigenous people for the actual name of the land. In any respect, it was written on the maps and the name stuck. So it's because of Jacques Cartier that this area begins to be referred to as Canada. Now remember Jacques Cartier's main reason for going over there was to try to find a route to Asia and to bring back any gold and spices and that sort of stuff. He obviously France wanted to do the same thing that Spain had done a few decades earlier. And Jacques Cartier did find what he thought was gold, although it was not actually gold. It was something referred to as fool's gold. It's basically iron pyrite, which looks like gold. However, he also did a trade with the indigenous tribes for furs, which were very valuable. And in fact, this would be the main reason why the French would keep coming back, because furs would be provide the economic reason for them to um, to go there. Uh, Jacques Cartier wasn't really the best diplomat. Let's just say that. On every voyage that he made, he generally kidnapped uh, indig a few indigenous people on every trip and took them against their will back to the New World. So he wasn't really um, uh, making a good effort to establish friendly relations with the indigenous people. Um, he did try to set up the very first French colonies um, in uh, what would one day be Quebec City. However, um, it was a massive failure. Uh, the settlers did not survive through the winter. Uh, most of them died of scurvy and the whole settlement was completely abandoned. <laughs> What's he saying, Father? Uh, Commandant Cartier, he's saying uh, this nation's name is uh, Canada. Canada? Ah, <laughs> Canada. Uh, big, big pardon, sir, but. The word he used, I think it really means those houses down no, there. No, no, believe me, I know the word. It means nation, and Canada is its name. But I'm sure it means the houses, the village. So the video that you just watched was another Heritage Minute, and this time it was trying to depict uh, the moment that Jacques Cartier got confused about the word Kanata um, and subsequently thought that it referred to the land, and thus that's why the land is called Canada today.
In any respect, um, these early voyages to North America had established that North America did have some value from the point of view of Europeans, but its value was not in gold and silver. Its value was in fur and in fish. Uh, the immense fisheries were the first reason for Europeans to come there. That had been established under Cabot's voyage, and both England and France in particular both began to send um, fishermen to uh, plow the Grand Banks off Newfoundland. And initially then those um, uh, fishermen would also do a little bit of trading with indigenous people on the coast, and they would be trading goods for furs. And the goods that they would be trading with would be things that the indigenous people didn't have. Um, iron and metal goods in particular were prized by the indigenous people. And we can see evidence of these goods far inland, far before Europeans reached there. So again, that's another piece of evidence of those extensive indigenous trading networks which existed across North America at that time. Uh, at the same time uh, that all this fur is beginning to come into Europe, demand continues to rise, in particular for um, beaver felted hats became exceedingly popular. That was the height of fashion in Europe. And so this just became much more of a reason to set up trading posts in the New World and eventually to set up permanent colonies in the New World. And by 1600, um, uh, uh, most of the European countries had attempted to set up some form of a permanent colony in the Americas. So it won't really be until the early 17th century or the 1600s that France would be successful in setting up a permanent colony. And their very first colonies will actually be um, in the land which nowadays is the province of Nova Scotia. The French called it Acadia. And they set up the a colony of Acadia in Port Royal, which was a settlement you'll see there on your map right here. Um, the settlement of Port Royal in 1605. And part of the reason why the French were successful in these establishments is that they completely changed their strategy with respect to interacting with the indigenous people. Instead, uh, they began to cooperate and work very closely with the local indigenous people, and in particular, the Mi'kmaq, who, um, whose territory um, Acadia was in, um, cooperated with the French and became friendly with the French, and this allowed for the settlements to ultimately be successful. Uh, but it's normally not the settlement of Acadia and Port Royal that people think about when they think about the early French settlements. It's Quebec City and Montreal and the other settlements along the St. Lawrence. And that was where Jacques Cartier had initially sailed and it's where Jacques Cartier had attempted and failed to form a colony a uh, half century earlier. Uh, it would be a new explorer, Samuel de Champlain, uh, who's the most important figure in uh, resuming French interest along the St. Lawrence. And it will be Samuel de Champlain that will successfully found the settlements of Quebec City and Montreal in essentially the same locations that Jacques Cartier had found Indian um, villages a half century before. When Champlain arrived, however, those villages were gone, but he did end up interacting and cooperating with the local indigenous people. And in doing so, he put himself in the middle of a long-standing conflict. The uh, tribes that he were in, was interacting with were friendly with the Wendat or the Huron, and the bitter enemies of the Wendat and the Huron were the Haudenosaunee uh, Five Nation Confederacy or the Iroquois Five Nation Confederacy uh, to the uh, south. And if Champlain was going to be successful in establishing these colonies and making friends with the local indigenous tribes, he was going to need, need to pick a side. He was going to need to to help them in their war against the Haudenosaunee. Champlain and his handful of Frenchmen have entered a complex and volatile world that is not theirs. But the native peoples of Canada are prepared to tolerate these strange new arrivals as long as they are useful. The Montagnier and the Algonquin have already been trading with the French for 10 years. They are allies of the powerful Huron who live near the Great Lakes. 
Together, they control the territory north of the St. Lawrence. To the south live their traditional enemies, the Iroquois, a confederation of five nations. For now, the Iroquois are cut out of the trade with the Europeans. In the summer of 1609, Champlain learns a basic lesson about doing business in North America. No trade without a military alliance. Champlain already knows the Algonquin chief Iroquette, who introduces him to a new partner, the Huron chief Uchitaguan. They urge him to go to war with them against the Iroquois. I promised to help them in their wars, both to engage them the more to love us, and also to help my enterprises and explorations, which could only be carried out with their help. Realizing he can do nothing without Indian allies, Champlain agrees. And so, a war party of 300 Indians and nine Frenchmen sets off from Quebec at the end of June. For a month, they head south through lands no European has ever seen. But as they travel deeper into Iroquois territory, many in the party turn back. Only 60 Indians remain now, along with three Frenchmen. At Ticonderoga Point, they finally meet the enemy. On the night of July 30th, the two sides prepare for battle. The whole night was spent in dances and songs on both sides, with many insults. Our side telling the Iroquois that they would see such deeds of arms as they had never seen. dawn, they come face to face with 200 Iroquois warriors. Our Indians told me that those who had the big headdresses were the chiefs, and that there were only three of them, whom you could recognize by these feathers, which were larger than those of their companions. I was to do what I could to kill them. Our Indians called me with loud cries. They divided into two groups, made way for me, and put me ahead. As soon as they caught sight of me, halted and stared at me. When I saw them make a move to draw their bows upon us, I took aim with my arquebuse and fired straight at one of the three chiefs. I had put four bullets into my arquebuse. As soon as our people saw this shot so favorable for them, they began to shout loudly. Meanwhile, the arrows flew thick on both sides. The Iroquois were much astonished that two men should have been killed so quickly. This frightened them greatly. As I was reloading my arquebuse, one of my companions fired a shot. Seeing their chiefs dead, 
they lost courage and took flight into the depths of the forest. The Alliance is sealed in blood. Champlain has passed his first test. We all separated with great declarations of mutual friendship. They asked me if I would not go to their country and help them like a brother. I promised them. The French are now partners in a great alliance, but they have also made the five nations of the Iroquois their mortal enemies. For almost a century to come, they will pay the price. So that was another excerpt from Canada People's History, the CBC documentary for which is in the recommended videos each week in this course. And that depicted Champlain's involvement in the war between the Wendat or the Huron with the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee Five Nation Confederacy. So to the south of the new French settlements, the English and the Dutch, or the Netherlands, as, as the Dutch are also called, began their own colonization efforts in the New World. And in fact, even Sweden got in on the action uh, a little bit. So the Netherlands in 1609 uh, commissioned um, Henry Hudson to try to find a new passage to India. It always starts with trying to find a way to get to India, and then they essentially realize that's not possible and they have to set up a colony here. Um, he uh, sailed in into Hudson's Bay and um, uh, came upon Hudson's River, which is the future site of New York City. And in 1625, the Dutch, in fact, founded a city there, which they called New Amsterdam. Um, a lot of the time, Europeans are really not that um, inventive when it comes to the names of their new colonies. Uh, new York, there's a York back in England. Amsterdam, New Amsterdam. Um, in any respect, um, New Amsterdam would eventually be conquered by the uh, English and renamed New York in 1665 after English forces seized it. And it is, of course, one of the biggest cities in the world today. But it was founded in 1625 as New Amsterdam. So the English also began to set up colonies and they had a number of successful colonies along New England by the early 1600s. Uh, New England became the main competitor to New France in that part of the world. Uh, New Netherlands didn't last very long. It was um, absorbed by New England and then it was really just France and England in terms of European countries in North America. England also tried to establish uh, some settlements in Newfoundland between 1610 and 1630, but most of them ended in failure. But there was a small English presence that continued in Newfoundland just north of the French. And so that pretty much made up the early attempts at colonies in uh, North America. And then you also have the Spanish settlements creeping up to the north. So you can see there at the bottom of this map a little bit of orange, which was the Spanish settlement um, in what is now modern day Florida. So the European countries are all over there. They're all competing. And this is really going to shape the destiny of this land for the next two, three hundred years.